The surprising effects of coffee on the body, not what you think. The benefits of coffee are numerous, even very numerous, and have been reported. It reduces the risk of prostate cancer, protects the liver from cirrhosis, and improves cognitive abilities in the elderly. Unfortunately, however, there is a big problem. Today, coffee is produced in many different qualities, and every system, every modification can significantly change the amount of caffeine and polyphenols. This video reveals whether coffee is good or bad for you, how it should be drunk, whether it should be served with milk or not. Is it true that coffee reduces iron absorption in case of iron deficiency? If you have gastroesophageal reflux problems, if you suffer from depression, epilepsy or schizophrenia, there is no problem drinking coffee. If you suffer from an eye condition such as glaucoma, this video answers these questions about coffee. Until a few years ago, I thought everyone agreed that coffee was good for you. We even made a video talking about all the benefits and the numerous studies supporting these benefits. However, all these conclusions were simply linked to associations and did not explain the true cause and effect relationship between coffee consumption and health benefits. The first benefit of coffee is its ability to influence the size of our blood vessels. Influencing the constriction of blood vessels is essential for our health since every organ in the body needs to be well nourished. Caffeine has the ability to constrict blood vessels as soon as it enters the body. However, this happens just like when we exercise or get angry. One might think that constricting blood vessels has a negative effect precisely because it reduces blood flow to the organs. However, this is only a temporary effect, just like when the blood vessels constrict during exercise. In the long run, however, the exercise of constricting and dilating blood vessels is beneficial exactly like caffeine has been linked to controlling hypertension. The main reason is that coffee is rich in polyphenols, which are antioxidants, the main one being chlorogenic acid. Thanks to chlorogenic acid, we are able to fight inflammation and free radicals. Unfortunately, however, not all coffees are made in the same way and some aggressive roasting methods can lead to the complete loss of anti-inflammatory properties. The more the coffee beans are roasted, the fewer antioxidants they contain. The lighter the roast, the higher the polyphenol content. Fortunately, however, polyphenols are not altered in the decaffeination process of coffee. So decaffeinated coffee is an excellent way to maintain its antioxidant activity. Do you drink your coffee black or do you like to add a bit of milk? Alas, unfortunately, as this study shows, just a teaspoon of coffee stained with 17 milliliters of milk reduces its antioxidant effect by 46%. And if you have a cafe latte with 100 milliliters of milk, then the antioxidant effect is reduced by 95%, practically losing all the beneficial effects. It is thought that the proteins in milk bind to the polyphenols and prevent them from being absorbed by the body. However, the same does not happen if you use soy milk. In the intestine, there are special bacteria that break down and digest soy proteins, releasing the polyphenols. Another crucial aspect of coffee is that it can reduce iron absorption. In fact, according to this study, adding coffee to a meal can reduce iron absorption by 39% after eating a hamburger. This effect is not present if you drink coffee an hour before the meal, but if you drink it even an hour after, then the effect will still be present precisely because it normally takes about two hours to empty the stomach after eating. So if for various reasons you suffer from anemia or iron deficiency, then you should be careful with coffee or avoid caffeinated beverages. However, while iron is an essential mineral for the proper functioning of some bodily functions, excess iron can be truly harmful. I have already talked about this in another video that you can find by clicking here. Very often, excess iron causes the same symptoms as a deficiency, and you could make the big mistake of taking iron supplements when you actually need to reduce it. In fact, when iron accumulates in the body, it has a pro-oxidant effect, essentially rusting our bodies. So much so that studies show that increased ferritin levels in the blood are associated with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes. And this negative effect of excess iron on health is also confirmed by studies linking it to greater Alzheimer's problems and a reduction in DNA telomeres. In fact, in people who suffer from gout, adding coffee to reduce iron absorption reduces inflammatory attacks linked precisely to excess uric acid in the joints, so if this is your case, if you suffer from gout, it is certainly worth using coffee to reduce iron absorption. But it's not just coffee that has this effect. You can find many other plant-based products that I've already talked about in another video that you can find by clicking here. And what about mortality? Is it true that coffee drinkers live longer? According to this systematic review of the literature, there appears to be a correlation between the amount of coffee consumed and increased life expectancy. However, the same study for people under the age of 55 shows an inverse correlation. 
meaning that people who drink too much coffee may have a shorter life expectancy. Finally, in recent years, a comprehensive study was finally conducted that analyzed all types of populations and unfortunately showed that this advantage in lowering mortality essentially can no longer be claimed to mean that coffee extends life or reduces the likelihood of dying. But let's get to the point. What is the main problem with coffee? The main problem with coffee is that we all consume it and the drug in coffee is called caffeine, which is indeed increasingly used in energy drinks to target the younger population. Caffeine is, in fact, a neurostimulant that can have long-term health effects. In fact, caffeine inhibits and competes with adenosine, a substance that our body naturally produces to signal that we are tired, so it is at very low levels in the morning but increases gradually as we spend more and more time awake, alerting us that we are tired and need to rest or go to sleep. When we consume caffeine, adenosine is inhibited, the sympathetic nervous system becomes overactivated, heart rate accelerates, blood vessels constrict and the brain activates. For this reason, since the Industrial Revolution, caffeine and coffee have been praised for allowing people to concentrate and work more efficiently. The main issue is that the more you use caffeine to block your adenosine receptors, the more adenosine will accumulate between neurons because the body has the ability to adapt. When adenosine no longer has its effect on the receptors because they are covered by caffeine, your body slowly forms more adenosine receptors over time, forcing you on the day or moment when you no longer have enough caffeine in your body and all these free adenosine receptors act on your body and produce the desired stimulant effect. You will experience all the consequences of caffeine withdrawal, which can include headaches, stomach pain and certainly, as many people experience in the mid-afternoon, feeling very sleepy and lethargic. Caffeine is indeed associated with an increase in gastroesophageal reflux, but this effect is halved with decaffeinated coffee. However, some studies also suggest that caffeine consumption is linked to an increased risk of incontinence in both men and women. Furthermore, in other in-depth studies, such as this 2014 meta-analysis, caffeine consumption is directly linked to insomnia. As shown in this study, people with glaucoma should absolutely avoid caffeine because its effects on the circulatory system can further worsen the intraocular pressure they are suffering from. The problems related to excessive caffeine consumption and insomnia or difficulty falling asleep are now well recognized. And in this case report, it was also indicated that removing coffee and caffeine from a person's diet reduced the frequency of their epileptic seizures and epilepsy problems. When you overdo it with caffeine, you may also suffer from tachycardia. That feeling where your heart beats very fast precisely because caffeine can produce adrenaline and stimulate your nervous system. But if you're afraid of suffering from heart problems or atrial fibrillation due to caffeine, fortunately this systematic review of the literature indicates that there is no association between caffeine consumption and atrial fibrillation. In fact, in some specific situations, two or three cups of coffee a day can be protective in reducing the risk of atrial fibrillation. In the escalation of serious problems related to excessive caffeine consumption, it has been found that the maximum lethal amount that can kill a boy or young man may be around 12 cans of energy drinks. So, to summarize, on one hand, coffee does contain polyphenols that help lower blood pressure, reduce inflammation and prevent oxidation, but on the other hand, it contains caffeine which can alter feelings of tiredness, constrict blood vessels and be linked to a host of other problems such as eye glaucoma, incontinence, risk of fractures, and many other central nervous system disorders. It is true that coffee can have a protective effect in people suffering from liver cirrhosis. It has also been shown that coffee can help people with conditions such as Parkinson's disease. For athletes, a cup of coffee can improve weightlifting ability. The main difference, however, is that the ability to metabolize caffeine varies greatly from person to person, and there are also genetic variations. Some people are faster metabolizers while others are slower. And this difference draws a clear line between coffee that is good for you and coffee that is bad for you. The conclusion is clear from this graph. The link between caffeine and coffee consumption and the likelihood or risk of developing hypertension has been analyzed. The more coffee you drink, the higher the risk of hypertension if you're a slow or slow caffeine metabolizer. The more coffee you drink, the lower your risk of hypertension if you are a fast metabolizer. On one hand, for every cup of coffee a slow metabolizer drinks, their risk of heart attack doubles, while for a fast metabolizer, one cup of coffee a day halves their risk of heart attack. On the other hand, for a fast metabolizer, one cup of coffee a day halves their risk of heart attack. So coffee does have many benefits if your body is able to metabolize and quickly eliminate caffeine. But you should not consume coffee with added milk or over-roasted coffee, as you would simply be drinking a dead substance without any nutrients. 
However, if your body metabolizes it poorly and caffeine remains in your system for too long, it can cause insomnia, cardiovascular problems, hypertension, and an increased risk of heart attack. Although we are generally told today not to drink three or four cups of coffee a day, this video has finally helped us understand that such guidelines are not useful for everyone, as there are significant differences between individuals and between different types of coffee. Some people metabolize caffeine quickly and coffee can be good for them, while others metabolize it more slowly and coffee and caffeine can be harmful. Some types of coffee are also rich in polyphenols, especially those that are roasted quickly and lightly. On the other hand, those that are roasted for a very long time do not even have the expected anti-inflammatory effect, as all the polyphenols are lost. Adding milk eliminates the anti-inflammatory effect, while the effect remains when adding soy milk. Decaffeinated coffee is a good alternative because, as we have seen, it removes caffeine, which has few beneficial effects on health. However, if roasted in the ideal way described earlier, the polyphenols remain. For these reasons, I myself have decided to reduce my coffee consumption and go a few days or weeks without drinking it at all to see how my body reacts. I encourage you to evaluate your own caffeine metabolism as well. If you are now addicted to coffee, unable to do without it, and unable to wake up every morning if you don't drink it, that's not a good sign. On the other hand, if you have a good metabolism that makes you sleepy even with coffee, as in my case, maybe you're lucky and you can drink as much as you want. Leave a comment so we can improve our creations. We would also be happy with just a like from you, but what is really important is that you don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next videos.